What I think New York sometimes suffers from is why do this if you can't like kill it, if you can't get loaded? Well, I have a restaurant in my neighborhood that I love, I'm incredibly proud of. There's better jobs for the people that work there than they would have at another place, hopefully. It serves the community, it makes really good food, and it's filled with optimistic people who like their job and who work really, really hard. And like that's enough. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hiesel. On today's show, Matt talks to Nick Rotola and James Murphy. Nick is the chef of Brooklyn restaurant The Four Horsemen, and James, you might know as the partner of the restaurant, but also as the frontman and founder of the band LCD Sound System. Later on the show, Taste contributor Max Falkowitz is going to answer a reader question about Chicago-style pizza. Is it really pizza? I don't know. Max will answer the question. But Matt, how is it talking to Nick and James? I drank bourbon and ate garbage. This is how James Murphy describes his culinary habits earlier in his life, before he started LCD Sound System, before he had a little scratch, before he started touring the world, and before he started drinking the finest natural wines by the Magnum. Now James kind of is like a wine expert. He knows a whole lot about wine. Totally a wine guy and knows a lot. He and I talk about this time when, in fact, he was asked on national French television to taste wines blindly. It's really an awkward video clip. You should Google it. And he tells the story about how it all went down. It's pretty good. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And we also talk about the restaurant Four Horsemen, where him and Nick um, are partners. And uh, Nick's the chef. And he has got three partners. And all the four partners are, they're not from the restaurant world. They have a really different approach. They just want a chill place to drink some wine, okay? That makes sense. Here's Matt talking to Nick and James. Nick Cartola and James Murphy, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. I'm. I'm. This is. Or long... you're welcome. What's appropriate? Oh, we could we go either way. I, I've been a longtime fan of your restaurant. First time caller. First time caller. Like for yeah, I've been a fan of your long of your restaurant. Long time fan of your restaurant. So it's nice to finally be able to get you guys together to talk about it. I saw on uh, Instagram recently that um, the Four Horsemen had a party bus situation happening. Oh, yeah. Nick can speak to that better than I can because I, I did not engage in the party bus. Wait, why not? Well, we had a sound attenuation issue where we, where we were getting sound leakage into our upstairs neighbor who's uh, our landlord and friend. And one, the, one of the ways we could test for it was by shining a light in a cavity and seeing if light leaked. But you can only do that at night and you can only do it when we're closed. So Randy and I thought we could quickly catch up with the bus, but the bus went on like a... Yeah. A three hour tour, a three hour Gilligan's Island tour. So you were on a was this the holiday party, the January holiday party? Yeah, we have a holiday party every year, and oh. this year we got a we got a superiority burger, kind of catered all the food, and then uh, we got a party bus afterwards. And I think there were what thirty of us, maybe thirty employees, more thirty. Uh, we were we were we were hard, handily filling the room. Yeah, it was yeah it was it was great. That was really fun. We went up to the Bronx to drop off one of our prep cooks who's been with us for a few years. And she had to be in early the next day for work, so oh. we took her up there and then came back. Rather than her being alone on subway system or something, right. she got the party bus. You just got the it was, and that was the only stop up to her apartment and, yeah, and back. That was it. And now she expects it every day when she leaves the restaurant. That, so the it's bus kind of, was kind of like the joke. Yeah. Where's the party bus? <laughs> Were there magnums involved? Oh yeah. Okay, let's talk about the wine. What was on it? The wow, wine. Justin. I think Justin and Randy pulled wine for the party. Um, I mean, n- nothing crazy. People. I mean, what's nice, nice about the place is that staff will also bring wine. Even though we have all this wine, people are pretty enthusiastic and will show up with stuff. Like, some people work also with distributors, so they'll get like stuff that they're excited about and bring in. Um, but it was pretty. It was pretty Jero-y at first. Mm-hmm. We were starting in with big bottles, definitely, which is nice for us because we kind of drink them at staff parties because people don't really order them. We'll the buy them. Us, people aren't. No, Jero's, like double oh, I thought you said Jura. No, they'll, those go within the week. But like a lot of times the big format bottles, which taste better and are great, um, we'll order them know that we'll order them for the restaurant knowing that yeah. it's going to be staff. <laughs> because <laughs> people, there's not, we're not big enough a restaurant for people to be like, I would like a double <clears throat> Magnum for this four top. Right. 
I mean, or you're just fucking baller. Yeah, I mean, there's there's that too. There's that uh, there's that element of New York nightlife. Nick, I wanted to find out a little bit about you and your background. So where like where did you cook before Four Horsemen? What was your what was that all about? Uh, before the Four Horsemen, I worked at. I mean, the place I spent the most time was Franny's, yeah. probably in New York, uh, and that definitely kind of like shaped and molded me as a as a cook and as a chef. And then before that, I was out in California. But I mean, I've been in New York almost ten years now. When I met you, when you were at Franny's, yeah, okay, That's yeah, yeah, I was there for a while. So. Amazing. Yeah, were you at the old space? I assume? yeah, the old space. I didn't work at the new one. So now with like the post mortem of post Franny's, what happened when they moved to the new space? Like, did they lose some kind of? I think I'm not sure. I mean, I think it had been around for ten years by that time, and it maybe had run its course. The owners were very involved in it from, you know, um, all the day to day logistics of running a business like that and a very busy restaurant. And I think they had two kids. And I, I know they moved, I think, to Vermont. Maybe they wanted yeah. to kind of slow down a little bit. And also both John and Danny, the chefs who had kind of been there for six, seven years, had both left and had started families as well. And I think it was just kind of, it kind of like happened naturally. I don't think it was due to kind of business or anything. Yeah, like yeah. I, yeah. I, I didn't want to hear any like weird goss or anything. I, yeah. I wasn't looking. I wasn't trying to go there because I'm just sad that it's gone. Yeah, that's all too, I'm saying. For sure, yeah. Now, James, how did you guys then connect for Four Horsemen? With Nick? Yeah. My wife and I uh, had an eye on this space, uh, and we wanted to do something with the space. We kind of wanted to do a restaurant or a wine bar, and uh, we'd been traveling a lot, living in... Uh, she, my wife is from Denmark, and she's one of the... Christina, she's one of the four horsemen. And there were places that we didn't have. So we we didn't have in New York, we felt. And we wanted to find a place like that in New York. We found the space, and we asked, literally went out to lunch... Through a friend, we were like, oh, Nick, uh, was, uh, my friend Nick just left Franny's. Like, it was like right when you left Franny's. Right. And we were like, oh, we'll be done with this. Build, we'll build this space out in two months. We'll be ready to roll. Let's, uh, let's, let's call him. And, uh, and, uh, a year later. Yeah, a year later. But what, what, what happened, what, what, this accident, which was a bad idea business-wise in so many ways, wound up being really important. Wait, like, the restaurant was a bad business idea? No, no, no. The idea <laughs> the, of like thinking we'd be, uh-uh. it, it being so delayed. But you, that's like, you, you build things quickly. That's what a musician does, right? No, you're, I'm slow. I'm you're slow? I'm really slow. It takes me much longer to make a song or a record than almost anybody in the world. Okay. Uh, but we, we, we thought we'd be able to build this quickly. We had all sorts of problems. But what, what that meant was we started doing these weekly l- l- dinners. Like Nick would come over and bring a, a, another chef friend and, you know, make some food. And not under pressure, just like, let's talk about food. And it meant that we went through four seasons of of ingredients basically before we opened our doors and so the four partners you know randy and justin and christina and i we're not chefs we're not front of house people we don't work in the restaurant industry we had we were like kind of like outside view people of what we wanted to experience what we wanted the space to be like and if we had opened after two months it would have been a lot of like us being like oh well can you make it more like this and you being like god this is such a pain in the ass like But what happened was, because we had a year of cooking and eating together, when we opened the space, like, we, we didn't get that involved in the mm-hmm. menu. Like, we, we, we were just like, hey, this is the kind of price point. Like, we were just talking about, like, basics of, like, you know, how, what, what things need to make. Menu to cover concepts you were talking about. Yeah, but we got to stay out of it. Because by yeah. the time we opened the door, Nick just does, he knows what the space is. Yeah. And, and it wasn't a space that he had to bend to, I think. I mean, no, yeah, it was more that right. we created a conversation and that it, it meant that you had a lot more freedom as a, as a chef yeah. because you, you knew what the space was already. You weren't like learning through us being like complaining about stuff. It was already like we already understood what, what kind of food yeah. we were interested in and we came to it together, which it would have been hard to do in two months. Was it really freaking you out a little bit that you were working with a lot of non-restaurant folks on this project? I mean, it's part of a lot of restaurant growth comes from equity, comes from different places. But I mean, or on the flip side, was it a, like embrace? Like, was it was it a positive, refreshing? So I think for me, initially, I was I was a little skeptical, but <laughs> I mean, after <laughs> Same, samely so, yeah. But after meeting everybody, I was really excited to be on the ground floor of like building this project and starting from scratch. But also. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of interesting having people that didn't have restaurant backgrounds and the perspectives they brought were much different than what most people would kind of like. We kind of went against the grain. It wasn't like, okay, well, everybody does this, but why? You know, like yeah. James especially is very good about going like, why? Is that 
just the easy way? Is there a, a way we could do this that it would be better kind of long term or you know what I mean? Like it was the conversations were just much different, I think, because that made the restaurant very unique. Because mm-hmm. you were a restaurant fan and had been going for years just with your travel, right? Yeah. Had seen a lot of cool restaurants around the world. Yeah, but that's like saying I'm a I'm a I'm I'm a big fan of the UFC, so I'm going to go fight. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. You know, like <laughs> no. it, it, it's. I worked as a busboy in the 80s in a restaurant. Like, that's my experience. Like, I d- had no... Um, but I, but because we've traveled a lot, we saw restaurants that had, like, almost no staff. We saw the radical different ways of people operating. Like, you'd go to, like, Fed Strand in Copenhagen, and sometimes that's just a guy. Or you we were at a, a hero store in Tokyo, and that was three people. And they did everything. One was a baker, one was, like, a, a wine person, one was a cook. And they kind of managed the space. And it was, so it was more like... If we're going to do these things that are givens in New York, I'd like to know why. I mean, I was, yeah. I wanted, I didn't want a linen company. <laughs> I desperately wanted to get washers and dryers down the basement and do all our own linen. Yeah. Because, because of the like, bill or just because of the ethic? Both. Like, yeah. it just seems like there's a lot of, when you, when you own a restaurant, there's yeah. giant industries that sole job is to take your money. True. Like, there's just these industries that just like, and I'm not like against them. That's fine. But like, they're just all, it's a very mature industry in New York. So like, there's like mm. there's a fire extinguisher guy, there's yeah. a there's a drain guy, there's a you know for everything there's you know somebody the who, liquor licensed lawyer yeah there's <clears> there's <throat> somebody who's got a full yeah. mature industry based on taking a certain amount of your money every year, and we were always like well we want people to have a better living wage we want to find cracks in the system and sometimes they were big mistakes like trying to go against the grain and um, but for the, at the large part I think it like. Even if a lot of our stuff wound up being more normalized, like we do have a linen company and stuff, I do think it led to people feeling like they could try stuff. I do feel like it led to an attitude in the space where there's a certain amount of optimism mm-hmm. and an opportunity to be freer and, and, and try stuff out. I mean, like I wanted a farm. Yeah. You know, and that's... Not still, so easy. They still do. Yeah, I do yeah. still want a but, farm. But the scale of your restaurant having a farm just didn't make sense, right? That doesn't matter. Nothing about the restaurant makes sense. <laughs> like, no, I mean, there's so many things we did that make yeah. no sense. Yeah. I mean, from the beginning, we wanted, we got this, the Nordak Fresh Water, which is like us, Noma, <laughs> 11 Madison Park. Yeah. It's like this crazy water system that we don't charge for and we don't tell anybody. Yeah. What's the maintenance alone? I don't even know yeah, what yeah, we pay we, for it now. Yeah. But like, we have a lot of things that we don't talk about. And that's one of the things we really wanted to be as a restaurant. It's a place that's just like, is for your, either for you to walk in and not realize how good it is and just have a nice time. Yeah. Or if you work in the industry, a lot of our regulars are chefs and people who work in the industry. And it's not just because like they can come let off steam. It's because they're like, they're, they can't believe we're doing some of the things we're doing. But you don't need to be told that. We didn't want a restaurant where like people are like, well, I'd like to tell you that this yeah. uni was hand picked yeah. by. You, you a, can yeah. see the details if you look for them. Yeah, but you, yeah. Don't, you don't have to. And if you don't, you're like, the yeah. bread's great. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, like Which I wrote like three times. I feel like a douche, but I love the bread. So <laughs> well, this year, I, I th- love, bread it, is great. This 2018, you requisitioned the mill, right? Yeah, yeah, we started milling our own grains. Oh, tight. The bread was like a six month prog project. Yeah. Prog, you said prog. <clears throat> project. Words. Worked on it for a while, yeah, before we opened. I mean, my I thought wife... you were saying Prague. Like, no. There was like something... Like, a six-month project. Oh. Like, my <laughs> wife is like a bread... She's Danish, and she's like a bread... Heavy-duty bread person. And and it was like... We were working for it. It was really good. And then you were like, Hey, guys, I didn't want to bring this up, but there's this local... There's this, yeah. like, organic wheat farm that's like... It seems like they have a stone, <laughs> and they mill it themselves. And then you... you Got it. Like, well, I'll just do the same. And wasn't it like this pretty much the same recipe. It was just with that wheat. Right. Yeah. And the bread was just like suddenly yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things we're always, we constantly tweak at, at the mm-hmm. restaurant, like daily. Yeah. It's kind of like, check out the bread. It's kind of like the one thing. It's like, how's the bread today? Everybody checks it. Or when we shape it the night before, it's like, how does it look? It's so good. Finding that right time to put it in the fridge to like retard it overnight and then mm-hmm. when to bring it out and when to score it. Nick, so. let me ask you. But what? it says house bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cultured butter. Oh, it's like, it's, it's house bread cultured butter, but you it's gotta, like this insane butter from Normandy, this demi cell butter. Yeah, from, and we mill it. We mill yeah. it. It's yeah, like it's, a, it's a lot of work for just like very yeah. little yeah. descriptor. Yeah. Tell me what was one of the crazier ideas that these guys had when you were the four of you were getting together to launch the restaurant? Because James is just saying how you know this is a place we want to break some rules. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously the linen thing for sure. Was like, <laughs> that was like a few months. 
Oh yeah, I was is like he serious about the linens. Like, is this? I was like <laughs> looking at my my brother like sells like meal and machines yeah, for yeah. hospitals. Oh, I was yeah. like, I'll get one of these machines. Like, like, he's like, give me some dirty towels. I'm gonna give to my brother so we can <laughs> go wash these. Yeah, things yeah. And yeah. My brother brought them to Mila, yeah. and like, you know, was <laughs> hey, like, yeah. you don't fucking know until you try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's exactly. And right. give me one more. There's gotta be one more like oh that was kind of out there. I love it. So many of them. This was like four or five years ago now too. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a lot. I mean, some of the things. When we dug out the cellar, some of the things we did, like digging out, earth. it was just like a luxury for me because it was like, hey, Nick's six six one, the cellar's only like five ten. Oh yeah. shit! We dug a cellar, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's like in a forty two seat restaurant. That's bonkers. We built a wine room, like mm-hmm. a, a thermal chilled wine room, and dug a cellar out for a prep kitchen. And it's like, I, I mean, that's crazy. It, there's no way that you can make sense of that as a business. So, James, why do it? Why, why, what is like, and it sounds like you're not really going to expand. It doesn't seem like you would have probably done that by now, at least. I mean, you, you may expand, but I just don't see that happening just from the outside. Well, sometimes what, what I think New York sometimes suffers from is that very thing, what you just said, like, why do this if you can't like kill it, if you can't get loaded? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a restaurant in my neighborhood that I love. I'm incredibly proud of. There's good slightly better jobs for the people that work there than they would have at another place hopefully um and it's it serves the community it makes really good food and it's an and it's it's filled with optimistic people who like their job and who work really really hard and like that's enough like that's a good reason to do something and i think new york suffers sometimes from like it's so vicious and so cruel and so like onerous the the rents are so crazy and like there's all these rules that people don't want to engage unless they're like gonna make a chain or gonna be like (laughs) you know it's gonna have 85 seats and they're gonna be able to like pull 25 grand a night you know like well we all as four owners were like none of us this this wasn't our careers all of us have other jobs, which means we're kind of absentee at times, which is frustrating. You know, it's, you know, we we can't come in and you know, although I am the guy who comes in when the air conditioner breaks. So like, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I'm that's the I'm the systems. That's I, that falls on me uh, most of the time. But we wanted to do it because it seemed like a good thing to do. I, I know that sounds silly, but that's no, that's, that's really what it was. That's really what it's about. Like it seems like a good place. You also can't bitch and moan about places being wrong if you're not willing to do something that you think is right. Do you keep your margins for the wine pretty consistent? It seems like, I mean, it's a very affordable place. I mean, it seems like the wine prices are yeah, I mean, we under have, control. We have a percentage based on what like the wines go for. And then we change that when we get things at auction. Oh, I see. Like, okay. So there's things, some things that we just want to have. And if we were to charge the same markup would just be silly. So, like, we'll be like, we're just going to not make much money on this. Right. You, like, will lower your margins on the yeah. auction items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you keep your price points very, I mean, in the world of wine, low. Yeah. Well, that's Justin. I mean, that's Justin's job at the moment. That was, uh, we have good we have good financial people that, like, look at this stuff. And Christina's an MBA. I mean, like, so, like, we're we're looking at these things as holistically as we can and trying to be, I mean, we have to be responsible business people, too. It's not like a lark. That's another thing. It's like, yeah. We aren't professionals, but it's really not a lark. Four years in, four and a half years in, three and a half, years. three and a half years. I rounded up. Uh, I guess I could give you a three and a half. Yeah. Well, we well four and a half since yeah. we've been together. Okay. Yeah. So I mean that, that that is not a lark. I mean you. There's plenty of restaurants with a lot of great ambition and great big ideas who just don't make it after that long. Well, we've also learned from owners like watching people who are like not chefs and not front of house people be owners and be like. Like vibe meisters, like you know, running around like making everybody's jobs harder, and we didn't want to do that. Like we made an early rule, like we're not allowed to touch anything. Yeah. Like we can't go behind the bar, we can't touch the point POS, the point of sale. This is the four part. Yeah, we can't touch anything in the kitchen, and that was a rule we made really early. Like nobody, we don't mess with. But you work the floor sometimes. Never. Or, not never. Well, I read on Yelp and Reddit. You're there though. Your presence is in the restaurant. Uh, I. I eat there. You dine there as a guest. I don't ever host or no, none of us ever do it. You're, you're Nick. I want to, your response is no, great. I was, I was just picturing that. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I love it. <laughs> Talk about that. You were picturing James working the floor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we joke about this, like I'm going to be like, you know, raging bull walking around like, Hey, you guys yeah. you having a good, you know, I'm just touching tables, making sure you're having a good night. Right. Hey, Hey champ. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, they definitely are all regulars there. Yeah, I mean, eat often. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, we we definitely meet weekly too. It's, yeah, 
And then that's that's the time when we can talk about kind of like behind the scenes. The only reason somebody could think I worked the floor was if they've seen me come talk to you. Right. Because I'll go talk yeah. at the station to you right, right, right. at the beginning and end of the yeah. meal. And then I'll talk to a, if there's that a friend be. eating, but I, I, that would be a really yeah. insane. Fire, fire table six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing back yeah, there. Yeah. Nick, Nick, let's get, <laughs> come, on. come on. Pick up the We're in the weeds here. Come on. <laughs> Pick it up. Table four has been waiting for their bread. Everyone orders the bread too, right? Pretty much. Oh, uh, yeah. We sell a lot of bread. As if, I'm just going to restate how great that bread is. Uh, James, I had a question about you appearing on a French TV show, Quotidian. Okay, so you're sighing for a long time, but this this seemed very challenging. In a language you don't speak, you were asked to taste natural wines on live national French television. How the hell did you get into that situation? Well, we played... I, I thought it would be really funny to do like a regular show. You know, like it's like an entertainment show, sort of like it's like the night... It's like a yeah. cool culture entertainment yeah, show. it like a cool show. And we were going to play a song. They're like, oh, we want to do a quick, you know, ask you about wine. Now, the, what I didn't understand is that what they do is they put a in-ear, they put like a little monitor in your yeah. ear and someone's translating live. Yeah. But with a significant delay. <laughs> like they're waiting <laughs> for a sentence which throws off all of your normal human interaction because you're responding. Yeah. It's like when you watch those weird satellite interviews on, on the TV oh, and they're yeah. like, so you so you think the president's going to come you know come out and say that we're going to go down with the and some guys like waits, yes Don I do and it's <laughs> yeah. a little bit like that so all my facial expressions are off yeah. and I became really self conscious because I speak I understand French decent yeah. decently better than English apparently <laughs> and but I was so I was trying with one ear to listen in French and then having it clarified so that I would I would start answering before the English was done because I'm like yeah I know where this is going and I'd answer. But it made this like, then they blinded me. Oh, is that what they were they doing? They blinded me. They didn't oh. tell me they were going to have me taste wine. They blinded me with oh. the wine. Which is like, I, I didn't get into it. Like, I don't like when people blind you. I think it's obnoxious. I think it's, it, it's a thing people do to like, be like, you want to arm wrestle? Show yeah. off a little bit. That's like, I don't want to arm wrestle. Like, you know, I'm a grown up. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he blinded me with like a really, and I, I was so thrown by it, like that it took me a minute and I was like, well, it's just Pinot Noir. And I'm like, but my brain is in the world that I inhabit with wine. If it tastes like Pinot Noir, it's not. Like if someone's blind, right, right, right. if some crazy yes, Danish what? dude They're is blind, blind yeah. he's like, you, you know where this is from? Well, actually, it's Concord grape and it's from yeah. like Mi- Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. It's like, come on, man. Like, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, congratulations. You're a jerk. But of course, what he was doing was bowling right down the middle with an obvious mm-hmm. Pinot Noir. And I was just like frozen for a second. I was like, I'm about to say Pinot Noir and it's not going to be Pinot Noir. Oh. And then I was like, it's Pinot Noir. And it was like, was. But it was like a very awkward moment compounded by like being blinded, yeah. being on tour and yeah. listening to delayed French. I mean, I wouldn't recommend. Listener, you got to check out the clip because you're a good sport, I think. And you play it off well because I would have been t- super rattled in that scenario. What was the wine? Do you remember what region? It was it was a Burgundy. It was a Burgundy. It was a Pinot Noir. It was a Pinot Noir from Burgundy. Burgundy. Like it was like literally the most bait. Yeah, yeah. But like the natural. It was natural though, right? I don't remember. Okay. Uh, like I really don't remember. I, I I like you never know how cultures deal with that type of stuff. Like some cultures really thrive on discomfort mm-hmm. and humiliation. So that was where I was going. I was like, France, are they gonna like yeah. enjoy humiliating the American? And I'm gonna say it's a Burgundy Pinot Noir, and they're gonna be like. Pfft. You know, I had no idea what to expect. It was awful. Was it after the performance or before? I don't. I think yeah. it was before. before I don't remember. Man. Oh, brutal. Uh, you like anxiety just thinking about it. Yeah, like, that's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Like if they were like, oh, chef, well, welcome. Taste yeah. that. Yeah. How was that made? And you're just like, dude, are you... On national television, yeah. foreign language. Without preparing you. No, with no preparation. But also your mind was in like music mode, not yeah. like, oh, my restaurant wine world yeah. mode. Yeah. You know and I mean? also it's like I take really seriously like not embarrassing our team. Like yeah. it's... Yeah, right. Like it's no joke. Like you can't like... Be like, you know, all wrong. And then one's just like, the four horsemen is a sham. It's like, <laughs> I don't work there. We ask, all of our, we ask all of our guests on the podcast, like, give me your dream cookbook project for the four horsemen. Is there one in the works? Is there one? Is there a grain of an idea? I mean, that does, I, mean I don't understand how to, like, it would be the four horsemen cookbook. Like, what, 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 yeah, yeah, the title would be obvious, but what yeah. would the actual concept be? Like, what would you want it to be? Like, how would it look? Well, we talked about this, and we we want it to be a representation of 
the place. But and that's like, <clears throat> I mean, it's a cookbook, so it would be Nick. But like, is it a cookbook that also has wine stuff in yes. it, or you know? Yeah, I think that would have to be a part of it. It would have to involve wine and definitely the team too, is what we've talked about. Because I yeah. mean, a lot of those people have been with us for years. I mean, it's a very small tight team and that's part of like the magic of that restaurant and we'd want to involve them um yeah. i mean whenever i look at cookbooks and i like the ones that aren't just like recipes and pictures it kind of shows a little bit behind the scenes yeah and that's something we talked about wanting to do because there's like some special stuff that happens yeah at the restaurant that would be cool for people to kind of get an eye on or like soft focus photos of you and like your whites with like a like a piece of fish on a stone yeah absolutely <laughs> <Love that. laughs> Yeah. Bringing back the late '90s cookbook styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. What story do you want to tell, recipe wise? Like, what's a recipe that you really feel like has a a, a really cool um, arc uh, to it? Yeah, no, we have this tuna dish that's been on for a f- couple of years now, and I think I think it's like one that I just kind of I don't know. It was like a perfect storm of like things we had in house and and an idea I had since before we opened, and just a technique that I kind of. I don't know. Everything just kind of clicked on it, and it ended up, it ended up being like one of our dishes that we kind of our menu changes quite often, but it's one of like a small handful of dishes that stays on all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, basically, I worked in Italy in two thousand six, two thousand seven oh. for about a year in Piemonte, and we used to eat like for family all the time vitello tonato. Like they'd always make tonato sauce, which you see kind of like you see it a lot. More. You see it like hack, it hackneyed versions ago. of it. I feel all around yeah, town. And, and it's like. That's one thing I'm kind of like, oh, you see Tonato everywhere now. Yeah. But, like, I legitimately had it in Italy. And I remember having it, like, and just thinking, like, what? Like, I've never heard of people putting tuna and mayonnaise before. This seems... Yeah. So I kind of, like, and it always kind of stuck with me. And I knew I wanted to do it at the restaurant. And we had just started getting in, um, like, yellowfin tuna. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do, like, a carpaccio almost. But instead of slicing it thin, I wasn't crazy about the texture. We pounded it out. So it has this, like, texture that kind of, like, really pulls apart. So it's like, you know, tonatos on the bottom of the plate. But instead of just this, like, really heavy mayonnaise sauce, we kind of aerate it in an ISI. Am I getting too technical? No, I love this okay. shit. But an ISI, <laughs> is, that like a, is that like a Paco Jet? No, it's like what a little it, siphon that you use to make whipped cream. Okay. And stuff. So we don't do, like, any kind Did of... Did you know that, what an ISI was? No, because I don't work in the or, kitchen. Yeah, I don't know that shit. I know what a Paco Jet is. Yeah, yeah. We, we have one of those. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Well, yeah. James gave it to us, yeah. Oh, it's um, cool. <laughs> but, uh... But yeah, so anyway, we, we charge it, and so it's a little lighter, and kind of like dissipates when when it hits the plate, and kind of like it's just a really nice light tonato, then like a thinly pounded piece of tuna on top. But we also put yuzu kosho and yuzu zest on it, so it's got like a good amount of like fermented chili heat, and then um, some smoked seaweed. So it's got like a Super smoky kind tradi- of like non traditional way, non traditional, and like this. incorporating like really refined like I would say technique, but also like really Mediterranean coastal. I mean, we put like this really beautiful olive oil on it. Yeah. Um, like an it excessive amount of it kind it of. It was a hit last night. Yeah. It's, it's, it it's, it's a really like well-balanced dish that on paper you're kind of like, okay, that sounds kind of weird, but then you eat it and it just kind of like, it really works. That'd be a cool narrative in the book. Yeah. James, I want to ask you, you spent a lot of time working at Plant Bar in like the late 90s, early 2000s on East 3rd. And I want to hear your thoughts about the neighborhood of East, the East Village and some of the restaurants in that neighborhood that have closed and any that you remember and you remember fondly that you're like sad or not there anymore. At the time I lived in the East Village, I didn't eat out. No. I don't know. Yeah, like I, I didn't. I had like a really narrow drinking and eating palate. I Interesting. Just, I drank bourbon and I ate garbage <laughs> uh, most of my life. Burritoville, at least. Yeah, like yeah. I, you know, I I, I had there's a sushi place uh, on Third Nay that I used to go to, yeah. and I ate at Two Boots Pizza, and yeah. I used to eat at Sidewalk Cafe, and I, I liked Veselka. Like Veselka was a yeah. big night out for me. Yeah. Like if I was gonna go, like I'm gonna spend a little money and go mm-hmm. to Veselka. It's yeah, yeah. It's, it was like the fancy place. It's it's consistent. Yeah, and that was. It. I mean, like I didn't really. I didn't. Food didn't. didn't you never eat. went to Bow One Eleven. No, no. no I mean, shit. my I'm Irish American. Like my parents yeah. just boiled stuff till it was gray. <laughs> like I didn't eat good food at all. Like we had great vegetables and stuff. Like we had yeah. a garden, but like nobody could cook. So I just didn't engage with food that much. Um, 
until I got until I got older. And so you got older, and was it for the travel with your? I band? think travel was the big one, like just being able to eat food and uh, and like eat food in different cultures and see how like. In, I guess it's like you don't see how much of food is part of your culture until you see. I didn't until I saw it in other cultures and how yeah. important it was. Like going to Japan and being like, holy shit, like this is like so radically different and so integral in a way. And I was like, I, it's like sort of like seeing your own prejudice when you see somebody else's. Like, and it was like, mm-hmm. oh, I clearly have like, and then at the time, American food was sort of like not that compelling. And it was, to me, it was, Marlowe was really important to me when I yeah. started living out here because that was like this, it, it felt very familiar to me in a certain way. It was like um, very homey and welcoming and like a bar and it's a good party vibe. And the food was really interesting and people were trying, like people were like putting an effort into the food in a way that I hadn't really dealt with before. And that became connected to a lifestyle. Like you said, the party vibe, but like it was a fun place. It wasn't like fancy. Right. That like was really key to me. It was like, and then I started seeing that in other, in other countries and started being like, like, and then as, as I think, as the food world kind of ticked up and developed, like seeing ways to find like, you know, to de-fancify, but also like get better at technique, whether it's like how the dining room works, like how the service is done. I mean, my ideal service is like somebody who always does everything from your left and you don't, and doesn't make you feel like they're doing anything right. Like doesn't make you feel like they're doing yeah. fancy service, but like knows where things go and how you're supposed to do it without ever making you feel formalized. Nick Cartola and James Murphy, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Oh, thank you. We're joined by Max Falkowitz, producer of Taste Food Questions, which appears on the Taste Daily podcast feed. Listener, you should subscribe to this feed. Max, I got a question for you. What is Chicago-style pizza exactly? So when people talk about Chicago-style pizza, people not from Chicago talk about Chicago-style pizza, what they usually have in mind is this really heavy, really doughy, kind of like the obliquely Midwestern cheesy pie casserole type construction. And there, there is something in Chicago that is that pizza. But if you were to ask the average Chicagoan, what is your daily workaday pizza, they would tell you uh, that it's something called tavern pizza, which is really just in Chicago pizza. Uh, And tavern pizza, it's a thin crust pie served in like bars and pubs, um, topped with a lot of crumbly sausage. It's cut into little squares called a party cut so everybody can have a little piece. And that for them is what is your everyday pizza. First, let's back up. Shots fired. Shots fired. You're calling this deep dish the Unos, the Dues, the Lumonatis, the Pizza, the Pequods. That's so iconic of Chicago. You're calling that a casserole. I'm. I'm. I would say it's more accurate to call it a deep pie, like a lot of early Italian pizzas. Like if you've ever had a pizza rustica, which is this like Sicilian specialty of cheese and eggs and ham, it's exactly the same thing. I went to school in Chicago and frankly love deep dish and don't understand why people are so opposed to it. It's definitely not the kind of thing you want to eat a lot of. And it's definitely the thing that it's very easy to go to go wrong with. But compared to other Compared to most other regional pizza styles, the good Chicago deep dish pizza places in, in Chicago are doing a beautiful thing. But back to the the, the real Chicago-style pizza, where should I go to find it? Where's a great spot in mind off the top of your head? Oh, that's a good question. So one of the most famous and deservedly so uh, – Pizza pizza places in Chicago is called Vito and Nick's, and it's been around for 90 years. And they're especially famous for their really fresh, crumbly, juicy sausage that they apply onto the pie. And it's the kind of thing that you can bring a bunch of buddies, get a pitcher of beer, and just like inhale and feel like you haven't like done irreparable damage to your body afterwards. <laughs> I love Chicago. What a food town. Max, thank you so much. Thank you. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening.